We'll go ahead and start. Good morning, friends. My name is Joy Boven. I'm a resident nerd at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. This is Bates Botanical Boot Camp, and today's topic is conifers. Um, before we start, I just would like to say that I love conifers. I've always loved conifers ever since I started into this industry, um, and I have been very uh, motivated to learn as much about them as I can. I still have a lot to learn. We all do, um, but I'm here to share some of my love for conifers and go deeper into what really survives in Middle Tennessee, in the southeast region. Um, the majority of conifers offer year-round interest, foliar interest in your garden when other things are deciduous and drop their leaves. That's one perk of having a conifer. They also, there's a lot of unique shapes and sizes um, to offer that visual, quirky interest in your garden as well. What is a conifer? Um, conifers are the oldest plant group on earth. Before there were flowering plants, conifers existed. All conifers are gymnosperms and are pollinated by wind rather than by our darling pollinators that we, have, we are so enthralled and passionate about. The majority of conifers have needles like pines and spruce. They also have scale-like leaves, um, more like the Hinoki cypress, which is here. Um, and then some have more of a broad leaf. That would be the cephalotaxis or Japanese plum yew or just the common taxis yew that we use a lot in the landscape. Um, there are also deciduous conifers as well. Uh, those would be the bald cypress, dawn redwood are two examples of the deciduous conifers. And then there's also the ginkgo, which isn't necessarily a conifer, but it still falls into the gymnosperm category. And the main thing about gymnosperms is they bear naked seed. That's what kind of brings them all together and their age. The ginkgo is one of the oldest plants known. Uh, it's often found in fossils. So let's get into the details of conifers that do well in the southeast and in Nashville, Middle Tennessee in particular. We've got the Atlas Cedar. That is close to this. It's also blue. Um, there are three main kinds that we carry here, Glocka. And fastigiata, both of those get rather large. The fastigiata, fastigiate, tends to stay a little more columnar. And then we've got Carl Fuchs, which is behind me here. That's a nice, um, decent size for a residential space. It's only supposed to get five, six feet wide. I've seen it get wider. That's the whole thing with conifers. Sometimes they get bigger than the tag says. Sometimes they stay smaller. So it's just helpful to observe them in the landscape as much as possible. Um, actually, I misspoke. This Carl Fuchs is a deodar cedar. Horseman is what I meant to talk about, which is also a small, tight, um, blue atlas cedar that does well in the landscape. So moving on, deodar cedar. Um, there's lots of different kinds within this category. There's large, more pyramidal types. That's aria, Carl Fuchs, and cashmere is another one. Um, there's a lot of weeping varieties. Feeling blue, feeling sunny, and divinely blue. Um, all three of these will get rather large in our landscape, uh, so uh, allow enough space for them to really sprawl out. They're more, um, they will send up a central leader, uh, but they'll still have that pyramidal weeping habit to them. Um, moving on to the next genus is Camisipris, false cypress. Um, first one is the Hinoki cypress, which is obtusa, is the species name. Um, the main uh, cultivars that we carry is gracilis, which is a slender Hinoki cypress. Those tend to get around 10 to 12 feet by 5 to 6. Um, there's a couple golden varieties, Cripsii and Confucius. Um, those will get rather large in your landscape as well. Uh, so adjust accordingly. And then the main, the largest one that we carry is Isley Green. That will get really large in your landscape. There are a lot of dwarf varieties as well of Hinoki Cypress. One of, this is called Spiralis, if you can see this. That grows really slow, tends to have kind of a windswept look about it. It's not, it doesn't grow straight. Um, there's also Nana, which is the most common dwarf Hinoki cypress and countless others. My favorite one, uh, the word wise, is butterball, is a cute one. That's supposed to say one by one. Um, 
moving on to the next genus or species in the in the Chamaecyparis family would be Pisifera. Um, most common being this is gold mop. So this is planted a lot. Um, it gets eight by eight, eight by eight. When it's planted, oftentimes uh, it's people think that it's going to stay a nice three to four foot shrub, and it doesn't. It, they get huge. So um, if you're going to put that in your landscape, remember eight by eight. Uh, count on it getting eight by eight. I've seen several in Nashville that are gorgeous but huge. Um, so remember eight by eight. There are. Uh, smaller varieties that have spawned off of golden mops. Some of those are King's Gold, Vintage Gold, Paul's Gold, and Golden Charm. All of those range more in the four to six foot range for how big they get. Um, they also stay a little more globe shaped, whereas the gold mop will eventually be more pyramidal. Uh, moving on to the next genus would be Cryptomeria or Japanese Cedar. Those do relatively well in Middle Tennessee. They are a little bit happier further south of us. I've seen some giant ones in Atlanta, um, Birmingham. Here, they need a little bit protect of protection. Um, and by that, I mean protect them from the northwest winds. They have a tendency to get burned in the wintertime. Um, so putting them on an east-facing wall or at least where there's tree cover behind it somewhat to break up some of that harsh um, cold from the winter. As far as the large varieties that you can get, um, and they take on a pyramidal shape, there's Yoshino and Radicans. The main difference between the two of those, um, just from observation, it seems Radicans holds, up, Radicans holds up to the winter winds a little bit better. It also has a darker foliar color, only slightly, but it's enough to tell the difference between the two when they're sitting next to each other. Next genus would be Capressus or Cypress. There's several um, species within this group. There's Arizona Cypress which is one of my favorite conifers because most, all of the Arizona cypress have a blue hint to them. They vary in um, the color a little bit, but they're all that light blue. So we've got Carolina sapphire, which is the most common and tends to grow the fastest of those cultivars within the group. There's blue ice, blue pyramid, chaparral, and aria, which has more of a goldish white hue to it. Um, next species would be Leland cypress. And this is a tree that's very popular. It's, it's falling out of favor um, because there, there has been some issue with canker, um, bagworms. So people are looking for um, other options instead of the Leland cypress. Uh, two cultivars within the Leland cypress category would be Murray, which is supposed to be more of an improved variety that stays smaller and Gold Rider, which has a golden hue to it. Um, next species would be the, the Weeping Alaskan Cedar. Um, Nucatensis is the species name. There's three main um, cultivars that we see typically here, and that would be Green Arrow, which is the hardest to find. Um, Green Arrow stays the most narrow of that group. Uh, Jubilee and Pendula. Pendula is the most common type that you'll see. And also, if you're going to plant this in your landscape, allow for a lot of space. They get really tall, and the two, Jubilee and Pendula, get really wide. Um, so keep that in mind. But they do, I've seen several mature um, specimens around town, so I definitely can say that they do well here. Uh, juniper is the next genus. There's a lot of different types of juniper, junipers. Chinese juniper is probably the most common, um, at least in, in the industry. Uh, there's large pyramidal versions, which would be Green Columnar, Spartan, Blue Point. All of these make great screening trees, if that's what you're looking for. They hold up to the heat pretty well and drought when we have it. Uh, medium shrubs for the Chinese juniper would be Angelica Blue, which has kind of a bluish hue to it and is really pretty when it's mature. Um, we've got Dobbs Frosted, which stays rather, relatively small, three feet or so, so it, it makes a nice low hedge. Uh, and mint julep, which will get up to five, six feet um, and relatively wide. So that makes, if you're trying to cover a slope, like a large slope, that's a good plant to use because it grows relatively quickly and it'll shade out the weeds underneath it. Uh, shore juniper or conferta is another species. Um, that is a creeping variety. We've got, 
This is Golden Pacific, one of my favorites. There's also Blue Pacific. Um, so they basically function the same way, just one is blue, one is gold. Um, but they hold up really well in the wintertime. The next uh, species that I was going to talk about is Creeping Juniper or Horizontalis, most popular being Blue Rug. Um, there's also Icy Blue, Mother Load, Blue Chip, um, Blue Rug being the most common. And so when I compare Blue Pacific and Blue Rug to, to each other in the landscape, um, it's pretty clear in the wintertime that the Blue Pacific holds up a little bit better than Blue Rug. As far as keeping its color, they both live here, um, but my preference will always be Blue Pacific for a creeping juniper because they hold up really well. Um, another creeping juniper that's often commonly used is the procumbens or Japanese garden juniper. Um, most oftentimes the cultivar you see is Nana. Um, that also is great for a rock garden. It's, it, it, it definitely holds up to drought conditions and heat. Um, last in the juniper category... Uh, species Virginiana, which is our eastern red cedar, which grows everywhere in Middle Tennessee and does really well here. There's three main cultivars within this group, if you're not going with the straight species. is Brody is a good one if you're needing a screening tree that gets rather, relatively large, um, but not as large as a straight species. And then you've got Canardii, which stays slim. That one's hard to find, but it's really pretty. And then Taylor. Taylor juniper is a really common plant right now because in Middle Tennessee, we cannot pull off Italian cypress. As much as people try, we can't do it. Uh, it's beautiful in other states, but Taylor juniper is our answer to that within the Middle Tennessee area because it's, it has a similar shape to it. Um, they estimate it gets 30 feet tall, 3 feet wide, so it really makes a very skinny, tall statement in a landscape um, and just kind of uh, offers that... Uh, more m contemporary look. Um, next would be spruce or picea. Uh, lots of, uh, I won't touch on all of the spruce um, species because there's so many of them. And, and often they thrive here, but I'll, t I'll touch on the main ones. There's abies, which is Norway spruce. Um, the large type would be capricina. Uh, that is a columnar version, but it gets relatively large, 10 feet plus. Two to three, three to four feet wide. Um, and then you can also find the straight species and definitely plan for that to get really big. Weeping varieties. My favorite is a cute one called Froberg. I've got one in my landscape and we've got it back here. It kind of, it requires most of the um, weeping spruces that you'll find. If you read the tags, they never tell you how big they get because it's kind of up to you. If you don't keep training this leader, it'll start to droop and go down. So it's, you have to train it to go up. And then over time, it'll become that what you've trained will become stronger and stay there, but it's, you need to have some staking when you're training those up. Um, there's lots of other weeping varieties. Uh, Gold drift, pendula is a common one. Cobra, uh, dwarf forms would be push, push, P-U-S-C-H. And what's unique about a lot of these um, dwarf Norway spruces is uh, oftentimes that new growth that pushes out will be different colors. Some are red, some push out more yellow uh, and offer a really interesting um, option for your landscape too, something to witness that you haven't seen before. Uh, Oriental spruce, Orientalis, is another type of spruce that does really well here. Um, we often sell... It's harder for us to find this, but I have definitely seen mature versions out in the landscape that do really well. I think, no, I left, there's one called Firefly um, and that we bring it. We just brought in this uh, fall for the first time, and that one is, is a really cute golden variety. There's also Skylands that we get in um, from our vendor, Isley, which a lot of these conifers come from Isley, um, which is out in Oregon. Skylands is a good uh, medium-sized spruce that won't get too terribly big, but definitely at least allow it six feet of width at the base. Um, and next species would be pungens, Colorado blue spruce. This is a very popular spruce to plant in Middle Tennessee, but I just want to advise you to use some caution. Um, they don't always like where they're put. They're very particular. I mean, in the 
the, it's in the name Colorado blue spruce. They don't always appreciate our humidity. Neither do we, but that's besides the point. Um, they can be a little fussy, so they need a lot of airflow. They, if you put them in a stuffy spot, they're really going to decline quickly. They also, another thing to know is when you're getting this tree established, to make sure that it gets adequately watered. That's another really um, key note. So perfect conditions for a Colorado blue spruce, in my opinion, would be to give it morning sun and sun until about 2 or 3, and then reprieve so that it's not getting that all-day Tennessee hot summer sun. Um, some of the large varieties that we carry would be Fat Albert, Hoopsie Eye, and Isley Fastidget. Um, dwarf would be Globosa or Montgomery are the two most common. Um, and then the Blues is a unique weeping cultivar within the Colorado Blue Spruce. Um, moving on to Pines, Pinus is the genus. Um, we sell also various kinds of pines, not all of which I'm going to mention. Um, most common would be um, mugo pine is often used. This is also a customer brought to our attention the other day that one of our tags said full shade, um, which is absolutely wrong. <laughs> they just printed it wrong. Uh, this likes sun, and it can take some heat, often used in rock gardens. Um but with that, even though it can take some heat, you still, when you're getting it established, adequately water it because it needs for its roots to really get going and established before it can take that abuse. Um, we've also got Austrian pine. That's a really common one. Nigra is a species. Uh, Oregon green is the most common cultivar within this group. Longleaf pine, palustris. This is a native pine that has definitely, it used to cover, I think it said, 90 million acres in, uh, in North America, now it covers about 3% of its original coverage. So um, there's a big push to replant it. It's a, a kind of a habitat tree for um, an uncommon woodpecker. That ha- it's, So it needs its specific habitat would be the longleaf pine. Um, and it also is a slower-growing pine, so keep that in mind. And when it's getting started, it takes about five years for it to really get going from seed. Um, and it just looks like a moundy, uh, it doesn't look like a pine at all. And then it'll start sending up that shoot and then it'll re- but the, um, needles are really long and interesting. So that's definitely worth looking up and seeing if you've got a space for it in your garden. Um, we've also got Japanese white pine, which is my favorite parviflora within the pine category. Aside from palustris, that might be first, but second parviflora. Um, most of those will stay blue. I don't think I, I didn't bring one in to show you. Um, but they typically stay of more blue needle, uh, stay relatively small. So you can use it in your landscape as a blue accent without having to give it so much space to grow. Um, Strobus is an eastern white pine. It's another species within the genus of pine, pinus. Those get really, if you're planting straight species, allow for it to get relatively large. And by relatively large, I mean 80 to 100 feet. So give it, know that, and also maybe plant it on the east side of your house and not the west side of the house. If you have a, if you've see, ever seen a pine fall, you'll understand they um, can do a lot of damage quickly. Uh, and uh, in that category, there's a lot of, of um, eastern white pines. We have some weeping varieties. Angel Falls is one. Niagara Falls is another. Um, those, if, as I've said before, adequate watering is important for those to get them established. Don't let them go through their first summer without getting supplemental water if we go through times of drought. Last in the pine family is Japanese black pine or Thunbergii. Most commonly, most common cultivar within this group would be Thunderhead, which is, uh, there are a lot of mature examples within middle Tennessee and Nashville that let you know this pine loves it here. Uh, Definitely allow it a lot of space. It's, it gets very leggy and army. uh, Army's not really a word, but you know what I mean? Um, It'll spread. So at least I've seen it 15 feet wide, maybe not necessarily. It doesn't go up always, but it goes out. So allow for that. Um, Deciduous uh, conifers would be bald cypress, Don Redwood, as we discussed before. Um, 
Bald cypress is typically a more water-loving plant. It can resist some drought. It's native to the Tennessee region. Um, But when it's getting established, make sure it stays nice and watered. Also, uh, there are weeping varieties of bald cypress, two of which would be falling water, which is a really pretty one that we have on the lot right now, and Cascade Falls is another. There's also a couple of columnar options within the bald cypress family. Um, Don Redwood, if you're going to do the straight species, uh, there's one in Nashville that is at least 80 to 100 feet tall. Um, don't The root systems can be kind of aggressive, so don't plant it next to your house. Um, but it is a majestic tree that you will absolutely love. And um, if you look it up, try to, try to find some. And, uh, there's one on Gallatin Road in East Nashville that's, really pretty and huge so try to check that out the next time you're going down that way there's a lot of dwarf varieties within uh don redwood My, uh, miss grace is a weeping one also a dwarf and then there's hamlet's broom also adequate water is needed when you're getting these established last group would be arborvitae and this is a um, there's a lot of cultivars within this group let me stop for a second. How, how are we doing on time we're doing good okay good Uh, Arborvitae, uh, first would be northern white cedar, which is oxidentalis, Thuya oxidentalis. Um, Tons, if you, everyone knows for the most part about emerald green. This is the most common within this group. There's a lot of other columnar options within um, oxidentalis. You've got Degroot Spire, which is probably my favorite. Rushmore has, has a little bluish in in the needles, a lot of um, greenish blue. Um, Holmstrup is more of a dwarf type, and dwarf meaning six to eight feet as opposed to 15 feet, which is, or 12 to 15 feet, which is what emerald green usually gets to. Um, but there are new cultivars coming out every day. There's one called North Pole. Um, so it's just a matter of if you're needing that, that skinny screen, uh, you could choose any of them and they would do fine. Um, Dwarf sports of arborvite of the Occidentalis would be. Um, did I bring it in? No. Oh, here we go. This is Anna's magic ball. Only supposed to get eighteen inches. Keeps this color really well over the winter time. It as it gets colder, it almost turns more orange. Um, but if you just want a cute little border, that is a great option. Uh, again. With Arborvitae occidentalis in particular, it is very important that you keep an eye on watering them. Every summer, if you drive around town, you'll see where there will be a line of emerald green Arborvitae, and a few of them are showing signs of decline, and that's usually because um, we're going through a time of drought and they're not getting watered. Their root systems stay really close to the surface, and so when we go through Intense times of drought, that dries out quickly. And so even if you've got an established line and it's an intense drought, you're going to want to give them adequate water in those times. Another type of species of Thuya, um, they have recently changed it to Plata cladis, but just we're going to keep it in, in the Thuya family for now, is Orientalis. Um, rare, it's rare that you see this anymore grown, but they, um, in trial and error, I have seen that these do really well in middle Tennessee. The most common one that we carry is called Morgan. It's a nice dwarf, stays four feet by two feet. Um, and it is yellow in color, yellowish green. So it, it is, if you don't want a giant conifer or something that's going to get rather large and you have a small space, Morgan is great. And so is Anna's magic ball. Um, Placata is another species within the Arborvitae family. That's western red cedar. Um, A little more rare to find, but this is a a cute little weirdo that we carry called whipcord. Um, It's supposed to get 4x4. Allow it. A good morning sun spot I think would be perfect for this unique character. But it's definitely fun within a landscape to use that. There's another one similar to that called Frankie Boy that's more yellow. Um, And Croon Google is another common dwarf type of western red cedar uh, that we carry here. 
Um, lastly, in the Arborvitae family is Green Giant, and that is a cross between the Japanese Arborvitae and the Western Red Cedar. So it has um, a bigger um, uh, scale-like leaf than the Occidentalis does, and it gets really, um, count on Green Giant getting at least 40 feet, and it'll probably get bigger with age, and 12 to 15 feet wide, or even 18 feet wide. This thing, this plant definitely gets bigger than people allow it to or um, accommodate for. So if you're going to be doing a line of green giants, I know it's hard to wait for them to get that big, but if you plant them eight feet, five feet apart, it, it long term you're not doing yourself any favors because they're going to choke each other out. Um, oh, yeah, and then we've also got the Canadian hemlock. This is the last one we'll talk about. That It's a really common one. We've been having some issues um, – with the past, especially in the eastern side of Tennessee, it's it's been taken out a lot of the Canadian hemlocks, the old ones. They're, the champion, in, in case you uh, were curious, is 165 feet tall with a trunk of six feet wide. So these things get humongous. I often see people put them next to their house as like a as that pillar, and it, that is just not the best place for this tree because it gets huge. Um, so that about sums it up. I guess real quick we'll talk about we've, – we've talked about watering a whole lot <laughs> because that's important with conifers is to make sure that they're getting that water in the heat of the summer because typically the majority of conifers are found north of us with the exception of our native eastern red cedar, the Arizona cypress, and junipers. Those can handle the heat a little bit better. But for the majority, they're going to need you to pay attention to them over the summertime, especially as they're getting established. Um, also, another thing to note would be just pests. Um, I don't want to get into this a whole lot, but the main two would be spider mites and bagworms. Everybody has probably seen bagworms by now. It's most common on Thuya occidentalis, the emerald green, um, or the um, Leland cypress. It's not as common on green giants, but it does affect green giants too. That um, just requires a little bit of scouting in your yard to watch for these things to start to develop. Spider mites is really common on spruce, but can f- be found on other uh, species as well and genuses. Um, so that's just two other things to note spe- specific to the conifer family. All right, so thank you very much. Um, next week will be uh, Melissa McKay will be speaking on fall container gardening, so make sure to tune into that as well. She's really excited to share with you guys all of the unique options for fall containers. So look out for that. And thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great day.